you're the guy. You know, you're going to be defining what category, which map to be using, and it can have a substantial effect on, with, on a lot of these areas as to how they're designed, and that affects, of course, the internal pressure coefficient. Because once you define the internal pres pressure coefficient, it's going to be based on whether the windows are blown out or whether they're secure. So this has, has quite a major effect. So how do you locate your building accurately? In the 05 version, we have a map that is blown up in the hurricane areas so you can more closely identify where the building is. But it doesn't show cities, it doesn't show roads, but at least you have a county and you can locate the building within that county. And the 10 version, it only has the distance map. In other words, you're going to have half of the U.S. on one map. And it shows the counties across. It doesn't show the state lines. It doesn't show highways. It's getting more difficult. But if you showed all the blow-up areas, you'd end up with three maps, and then you'd end up with the blow-up areas as well. You'd have a lot of maps in the, in the ASC-7. So where did you go? Well, this is kind of a useful tool, and that is going to atcouncil.org slash windspeed. Now, this organization was set up by engineers and designers, primarily on the West Coast initially, and they were trying to define exactly where the earthquake hazards were and where, the, um, where they had to design buildings differently from a seismic load standpoint. But eventually, they also had wind in there, and they spread wind, to gr wind and earthquakes across the U.S. This is funded uh, in part by one of the major sponsors, the ASCE, but there's several organizations that have funded this source of data. And uh, it's free to the user, so you can go on this on a wind site, and this is the report that you will get. The report shows the latitude and longitude, and if you have that, Rather than defining the location of the building, you just put in the latitude and longitude in the previous page, and it will define where that building is and what the wind speeds are. It gives the wind speeds for ASC 7-10, risk category 1, 2, and 3, and 4, and it shows it without having to extrapolate between the contours like we normally do. It'll tell you exactly what the wind speed is at that location, and it shows the mean recurrency interval for 07 maps, um, and it will show the value there for the 05. So you have a lot of data on there just by locating that building. This map is a typical Google map, and you can zero in, get closer and closer. It will show the streets. You can put the building on the street that you want it on, and it will tell you what the latitude and longitude is, or you can drive to a site and read it off your GPS in the car. You know, as long as you have those values or you can pinpoint where it is, you have the wind speeds. Now, if you're in a special wind speed area, meaning places where they have speed up of wind, like mountain areas or something, it will tell you to see the building official. It won't give you the wind value. But other than that, even places like Granby, up in the mountains, it tells you what the wind speed design is for that area. So it's quite, it's quite interesting, and I would encourage you to use that to identify the wind speed in a given area. Change in exposure categories. Remember that K sub H is the, is the coefficient that adjusts for building height and surrounding terrain. We've used that for a, a long time. This is the area that has really changed, and that's surface roughness exposure C and D in hurricane areas. In the 05 version, it states that buildings located adjacent to water surfaces in the hurricane-prone regions are included in surface C. Now, if you remember why that is, it's because people have considered the waves to be 30 feet high in a hurricane on the ocean and that these would act like 30-foot high buildings and roughen up the air. So we would not put them in D, we'd leave them in C. But now they've found that hurricanes die more rapidly, but also when they're going over water, the roughness of the waves really doesn't affect it. 
so it now goes in category D, that can be a considerably higher wind uplift pressure. So if you're designing anything located along the ocean in a hurricane prone region, you could have substantially higher values because you're now going to be in, in smooth water uh, exposure. And they'll look at it as category D. There are other changes just in the way that it's put together. And that is that um, we have a simplified procedure in ASC 7-10 that covers buildings up to 160 feet instead of just uh, up to 60 feet. So we've got more tables, more definition. There are more building profiles in ASC 7-10 than there was in 05. That means like dome, sawtooth, all the different profiles getting the uh, case of H. And the organization will throw you. It'll take some getting used to. In ASC 705, everything was for wind was in Chapter 6. Now we've separated into two major uh, chapters, and then there are other pieces in different areas. For instance, risk category is defined in Chapter 1. It applies to all buildings, structures, structural design, as well as wind design. And so you'll have to get used to the organization of the book. But once you get used to it, it's pretty efficient. There's really nothing wrong with it. It just takes a little time to get used to how it's organized. So what's the net effect? Are we going to have higher uplift pressures, lower uplift pressures? What's the net effect of going from ASC 705 to 10? This is the same equation. This is going to be considerably higher, that is the, the velocity pressure will be higher due to higher wind speeds, and the GC sub PI may be higher due to risk category and need for protective glazing. So it depends on how, how you choose your wind maps. The velocity pressure equation is the same one we looked at before without the importance factor. It's going to be significantly higher for the velocity pressure. The um, velocity pressure will be significant higher due to the use of strength design wind maps. It could change significantly when you're near an ocean because of the definition of the exposure categories. Um, it could change due to the enclosure classification. Uh, if you're in a wind-blown de debris region in one map and you're not in another, it could change it considerably. And it could change just by a conservative choice of a risk category. And that is because it's not as well defined, you may put things into a risk category three or four that you would previously put into a risk category two. So that's kind of where the thing is as far as the net effect on the, on the changes. Uh, for the main land US, in other words, the main part of the US or even California, Oregon, Washington, uh, the coastal states, uh, you're not going to see a change. By the time you multiply with a load factor of 0.6 to compensate for strength design maps, it's not going to change significantly. So you're pretty much where you were before. When you get close to the hurricanes, you may go up or you may go down, depending on where the building is. If you're near the ocean, it's probably the uplift pressure is going to go up. If you're inland further, you may not even be in a hurricane-prone region anymore, so it'll go down. So it depends on where you, where you are in, in the, the U.S. One other question, just one more, and that is the net effect when it comes to other organizations. Right now, everybody's been used to using ASE 705 wind map, right? And in fact, if you look at FM Global, for instance, their definition of uplift pressure, the wind maps are identical. It's become very easy to say if I pass FM Global, it's going to be passing ASE 7 because FM Global always used an importance factor of 1.15 just because they insure it. Is that going to be the case? I've talked to FM Global and they've indicated they have no intention of changing the wind maps to the new ASE 7. So there's going to be a difference. And you can understand why FM Global is an insurer 
and they're insuring the roof against blow off, they're not in the structural design business. So you're not going to be, they're not as interested in the ultimate wind speeds. And they'll be using some portion, something like the old map in some way. How about ES1? That's now a combination of Spry and FM Global. I doubt if they will change, other than the fact they may take a map and put the new contour lines on them and the old wind velocities. I'm not sure. You know, that's, that's up for grabs. There's going to be changes. We've got wind calculation uh, uplift pressure calculators, both in NRCA and SPRY. Uh, I would be surprised if they're not working on those now to make them consistent with ASE 7, but I don't know. Uh, well, all I'm pointing out is that there's going to be a fair amount of confusion because you're going to have to calculate both ASE 7 according to their rules, ASE 7-10, in order to comply with the International Building Code, and you're going to have to calculate FM Global, and you're going to have to calculate ES1 and other uh, pressures using different wind speed maps, different categories, different definitions. So it's going to affect you. That's about the, that's the major part of the differences between ASC 710, now the new one, and the old. Any questions? Yes, Jerry. Um, when we're talking about a, a, a risk factor in the category three or four range, and that it um, was also affected by the glazing, but how are we to design a, a roof that where the pressures could be changed internally, that internal core efficiency changed by the windows being blown out, which now uh, relates to uplift pressures on our roof system. Now, who's going to be liable for that? Yeah, there are going to have to be decisions made. The basic decision is whether you're going to be in risk category three or four or two, and it affects windblown debris regions with blowout windows. It's going to affect wind speeds, you know, a lot of different things. And it's not clearly defined anymore, except if you've got a normal office building that's um, a decent size office building, you're going to put it in category two. But when it comes to unusual buildings of any type, somebody's going to have to help with that decision, is the way I look at it. Now, I could be wrong in the way uh, you, you can make your best judgment and not talk to anybody, and that's that's up to you and your liability. Uh, any other questions? Dave? Mine is more of a comment, and, and it revolves around, you know, the, this, uh, uh, you know, this risk category, since it has gotten so fuzzy, that it would be incumbent on all of us, you know, to look at our errors and emissions insurance carrier, get their input as to how they view our work in this arena, and then the assignment for any particular project for that risk category needs to be, you know, that discussion with the building owner and the roof consultant, maybe even the building owner's insurance carrier to say, we've got to make this and do this smart. You know, otherwise we may err on the side of conservancy, which means move everything to, you know, to risk category three or four, and I don't know that we actually do a service to our clients that way. So get clarification, get someone else, you know, to, to make that decision. That may be the building owner and or the building owner's insurance carrier that makes that decision, buys into it. Very, that's very important. And uh, you're just drawing more attention to the risks associated with the selection of a risk category map. Uh, so it's going to be important. Anybody else? Thank you all for attending. Appreciate it.